welcome to another episode of 17th Century Tales, Civil War stories from the East Midlands, recorded in a secret Nottingham Roundhead location. Episode 10, One Town, Four Governors, Part 1. Last two episodes in this podcast, we've been looking at roundhead stories from the East Midlands to redress something of a balance in that we have been favouring cavalier stories for various reasons I explained in the last podcast. Well, I am done with that and we're going cavalier with a vengeance this time, tallying not one story, but four stories, the stories of the four governors of Newark that defended Newark against those pernicious roundheads during the three sieges of Newark. And if you don't know the story of the three sieges of Newark by now, you are really listening to these episodes in the wrong order. Go back and listen to episode one, like I repeatedly instructed you to do many times over the course of this series. And as there is a lot to say about the four governors of Newark, we have split this episode into two halves. In the first half, we're going to look at John Henderson and Richard Byron. And in the next episode, we're going to look at Richard Willis and John Bellasize, all four of which have been mentioned in various degrees of passing over the course of the last eight or nine episodes. But we haven't got into the detail of their incredible, fascinating, adventurous lives. But before I do, a word of apology about last week's episode. The episode entitled The Puritan Power Couple, the one about John and Lucy Hutchinson, the governor of Nottingham and his wife. In that episode, for all you history pedants out there, there were two, from my point of view, quite glaring errors that I would like to apologise for and acknowledge today. Firstly, I mispronounced Lucy Hutchinson's maiden name. I called her repeatedly Lucy Aspley, and it's really pronounced and spelt actually. Lucy Apsley, and I've still probably mispronounced that, but even that wasn't as grievous a sin against history as the sin that I committed in the form of actually getting the that the first year of the Civil War completely wrong, making reference to the Hutchinsons getting married in 1642, and then a year later the country exploding into Civil War, whereas it was actually a few months later in 1642. It's ridiculous. I know when the Civil War started. I don't know what was wrong with me that week. I blame roundhead gremlins, and I'm I'm never going to give the roundheads the benefit of uh, an episode to themselves ever again. There we go. Back to the more solid ground of cavalier history. And John Henderson, the first governor of Newark during the Civil War, or as I like to call him, the gung-ho governor. Governors in a civil war context, by the way, were military leaders of towns. And if you were a resident of Newark and you wanted a governor with a lot of experience to protect you from the marauding roundheads, you couldn't have picked a better person than John Henderson. Like many soldiers who had accrued military experience before fighting in the civil war, John Henderson had done his time on the continent, racking up an enormous amount of impressive military experience in the Thirty Years' War, the bloody and brutal conflict that engulfed Europe for three decades, hence the name, and is far too complicated for me to explain to you, namely because I don't actually understand that. But we don't need to understand it, or we need to understand that it was incredibly violent and it provided a lot of soldiers from the British Isles the necessary experience that they would bring to bear in the way they fought the Civil War. But before I talk to you about John Henderson and the Thirty Years' War, just a few things that you need to understand about him. He was Scottish, he was born in Fife, and he was a Roman Catholic. He was always prone to adventure. There's a rather romantic story attached to his youth. Between the years 1618 and 1628, John Henderson did a lot of travelling around Asia and Africa, perhaps on some business for the king. It's not really certain what he was doing there, but he managed to get himself captured and was imprisoned in Zanzibar. And a princess from Zanzibar was said to have fallen in love with him. 
So much so that she decided to turn her back on her religion and her faith and help him escape and return back to the British Isles with him. She somehow sprung him from his prison, organised for them to escape on a merchant vessel, sail up the Red Sea, arrive in Egypt and Alexandria, and then she dropped dead. But the princess possessed a picture of herself which John Henderson took with him back to Scotland and treasured. And that picture became the basis of a painting by the artist Walter Freer called Portrait of the Princess of Zanzibar with an African Attendant. Sounds fanciful and embellished as a story. Maybe, maybe not. But John Henderson's more credibly documented adventures during the Thirty Years' War a short while later would reveal not so much a chivalrous gentleman, more a very capable but somewhat fickle mercenary. I mean, he literally was a mercenary and started his military career in the Thirty Years' War fighting for Sweden against the Holy Roman Empire who were Catholics, and he was a Catholic, but he was fighting for Protestant Sweden. Mercenary. John Henderson began his stint as a mercenary under the command of the celebrated Scottish soldier, also a mercenary, James Hamilton, in 1632. After a successful campaign in Lower Saxony, he was promoted to the rank of Colonel of a Dragoon Regiment. Dragoons being a form of mounted infantry who rode around on horses to get about, but did most of their fighting on foot. In November 1632, John Henderson took part in the really rather epic Battle of Lutzen. It was a bloody battle, fought under a thick blanket of fog. John Henderson was seriously under-resourced, Rather than a full-size regiment, he had 180 men under his command and no horses. Dragoons without horses. Out of his 180 men, 54 of them were killed in the battle. Nevertheless, Henderson does well and manages to novel 11 pieces of enemy artillery and set fire to quite a few gun carriages. But in spite of his exemplary conduct with limited resources, the Swedes lost the battle. And it was quite a catastrophic defeat because the Swedish king and authentic military genius Gustavus Adolphus was killed fighting that battle. Shortly after the defeat, Henderson changed sides and joined the Catholics. Between 1633 and 1638, he was colonel of an imperial dragoon regiment stationed in Bohemia. He fought the Swedish and was shot and wounded by the Swedish and captured by the Swedish, the people that he had abandoned to join the Catholics, and was a prisoner in Augsburg for two months. The Swedes let him go and then Henderson worked as a diplomat for Ferdinand II, the Holy Roman Emperor, and Ferdinand II tasked John Henderson with trying to turn Duke Bernard of Saxe-Weimar, a leading Protestant enemy, and persuade him to join sides with the offer of money and lands. Henderson was unsuccessful. And then he was captured again by the Swedes. And then he was released again. And then he decided he'd had enough and returned back to England to serve King Charles I. Now, this was in 1638, just in time to participate in the Bishops' Wars, the religious conflict between Anglican England and largely Presbyterian Scotland that preceded the Civil Wars. Henderson was a Scot, he was also a Catholic, so he fought against the majority of his own country. In 1642, the Civil War began. Yes, 1642, I do remember when it was. And John Henderson, who was now Sir John Henderson, exhibited a steadfastness during the fighting that he had previously been incapable of when fighting for money on the continent and served his king well, at least while there was fighting to be done. John Henderson was given the job as military governor of Newark 
and was governor during the first siege of Newark when 6,000 roundheads commanded by Major General Thomas Ballard marched against the town at precisely the point when Newark was under-resourced with soldiers and its siege defences were quite frankly pitiful. But if there's one thing that we do know about Sir John Henderson from his conduct at the Battle of Lutzen is that he could do an awful lot with very little. Now, the first siege of Newark took place on the 27th of February, 1643, and famously only lasted a day and a half, with the Roundheads leaving in humiliating defeat. The reason for the Roundhead defeat rests largely and squarely on the shoulders of their commanding officer, Major General Thomas Ballard, and his bad decision-making and possible motives for making bad decisions have been covered in the podcast The Rubbish Roundhead. But the contribution of Sir John Henderson in stoking and maintaining the fighting spirit of the Newark defenders cannot be underestimated. During the fighting, the Scottish Cavalier mounted a white horse and rode around Newark low in the saddle to avoid getting shot dead, being exactly where he needed to be where the fighting was thickest in order to encourage his soldiers to defend Newark and deny the Roundhead's access. Gun ho After his incredible contribution to the Cavalier victory at Newark, John Henderson didn't stick around as governor for that long because he was needed elsewhere. He's clearly a very gifted soldier on horseback, and his services were required relieving the besieged castle of Bolingbroke in Lincolnshire in autumn 1643. The fight that occurred as a consequence was called the Battle of Wintsby, famous for being the first time Puritan super soldiers Oliver Cromwell and Sir Thomas Fairfax teamed up, which was massively unlucky for John Henderson. The Battle of Winsby turned into a bit of a rout for the Cavaliers. About two to three hundred of them were killed by the Roundheads, who only lost about 20 soldiers in return. The Roundheads took around 80 prisoners. Guess who was one of the prisoners? Sir John Henderson. Henderson managed to escape and fled England for the continent and, and became a diplomat. But not, as you might imagine, for his old benefactor, the Holy Roman Emperor, but for the King of Denmark, who was fighting against the Holy Roman Empire. Mercenary. And Christian IV, the King of Denmark, sends his new diplomat, Sir John Henderson, back to London to negotiate with the Parliament that he's recently been in prison for fighting against. Almost as soon as Henderson turns up in England, he's arrested by Parliament for the second time and locked up in prison. I mean, he's a let go eventually. I mean, no one seemed to want to keep John Henderson as a prisoner for very long. But Christian IV is having his ears bent by both the English Parliament and his own advisers for employing someone whose loyalty is questionable at the best of times. And then it gets really complicated. John Henderson returns back to Denmark, seemingly at the behest of King Charles I. And then in 1645, Denmark sends John Henderson back to England to run interference in any attempt that Parliament has to ally themselves with Sweden. Are you following this? Well, I hope so, because keeping track of John Henderson's loyalties is about to become even more tangled. And time is short, and I want to get to the second governor. I'm just going to rip through John Henderson's confusing diplomatic career. We'll jump forward to the death of Charles I in 1649, which sort of leaves John Henderson a little bit bereft of the one benefactor you could argue that he's been anything that constitutes remotely loyal to. He tries to transfer his allegiance to the king's son in exile, Charles II, and John Henderson is instrumental in trying to raise finance for Charles II's attempts to retake the throne of England. His efforts come to nothing, and John Henderson considers 
you know, just picking up his old profession as a as a as a soldier of fortune. And then Henderson falls foul of Charles II on account of suspicion that John Henderson is currently using his position to get his mates jobs in the administration of Ferdinand III, the current Holy Roman Emperor. Sorry, you mean the Catholic Holy Roman Emperor that that uh, John Henderson wasn't supposed to be working for anymore? Details, mere details. And then it gets really, really rather complicated. And I'm, I'm just going to rip through this next bit because there's a lot of treachery to cover. John Henderson finds himself in Paris at the time, equally annoyed with Charles II because he thinks Charles II owes him money. And then he finds an advocate in Lord Rochester, the father of the saucy restoration poet, who sends John Henderson to Austria to continue as a diplomat. But Henderson annoys people because he drinks a lot and then seems to be buying guns and ammo for the royalists. But John Henderson is writing to Oliver Cromwell and telling him about the deal that he's done with Rochester. And then John Henderson quits his job for the imperial court of Ferdinand III and then tries to get back in Charles II's good graces and receives a flat note and a hard pass from Charles II. And then he turns up in London kind of, sort of, working for Oliver Cromwell. Much to the annoyance of Cromwell's chief spy master who declares John Henderson to be a mercenary. No, not John Henderson. And in all this confusion, John Henderson has still managed to find the time to marry and have six children and develop a really rather serious drinking problem. And having burnt every single diplomatic bridge available to him, John Henderson goes back to being a soldier for hire again and fights for Poland and then fights for the Danish and then is captured and court-martialed and then bailed out because of British diplomatic intervention. But in typical John Henderson style, it's really unclear as to whether the Roundheads or the Cavaliers got him off the hook. And after that, he disappears from public life. Which brings us to the far less complicated story of the second governor of Newark, Sir Richard Byron. And Sir Richard Byron's story is largely less complicated because he stayed in Nottinghamshire for most of it. So press pause, have a cup of tea, come back and brace yourself for the story of governor number two, the other Byron. But before we do, let's address the early 19th century elephant in the room. So Richard Byron is related to the poet Lord Byron. He's his ancestor. It's the same family. And they both lived in Newstead Abbey. But there were lots of Byrons in the Civil War, and it's easy to get confused. In fact, I did get confused. I started researching the wrong Lord Byron for this episode and only realised after an hour of notes. There were lots of Byron brothers knocking about in the Civil War, and all of them fought at the Battle of Edge Hell. The most famous of them was Sir John Byron, whose father was also called Sir John Byron. Sir John Byron Jr., the brother of our Richard Byron, was something of a cavalier superstar. He was a best mate of Prince Rupert of the Rhine and was with Rupert during his lunatic cavalry charge at the Battle of Edge Hill. Sir John Byron helped secure Oxfordshire for the king and received a nasty, but I would imagine rather fetching, facial scar for his troubles when he was slashed across the chops with a halberd. As a gifted cavalry officer, he played a significant part in delivering the Royalists a victory at the Battle of Roundway Down, and he was present at the Battle of Newbury, and although the parliamentarians won the battle, Sir John Byron did not disgrace himself, and for his heroic conduct on that particular field of battle was made Lord Byron, the first Lord Byron, one of many. He was also an extraordinarily controversial figure and earned the nickname the Bloody Braggadocio for not only perpetrating a massacre at Bartholomew in Cheshire, but boasting about it afterwards. That was Sir John Byron, but that's not the brother that we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about his little brother, Sir Richard Byron. 
Now, when I said that Sir Richard Byron's story wasn't that complicated, that wasn't strictly true. I mean, he did stay in one place and he did confine his efforts to Nottinghamshire. But the complications came in his family loyalties. By blood and marriage, Sir Richard Byron was related to two other characters that have turned up in these podcasts, Roundheads. One of them was Colonel Francis Hacker, the subject of episode two in this series, Three Brothers. But apart from a bit of haggling over money that I don't really understand, Francis Hacker doesn't really contribute very much to this story, so I'm not really going to deal with that. More significantly, Sir Richard Byron's cousin was Colonel John Hutchinson, the governor of Nottingham during the Civil War. And Sir Richard Byron was governor of Newark. So these two cousins were responsible for defending their respective towns against each other and then planning to take the other's town. And one of the problems with Sir Richard Byron, unlike his brother, Sir John Byron, is that there's not an awful lot written about him except by Lucy Hutchinson, the wife of Colonel John Hutchinson. She has an awful lot to say about him. So it's largely through the writings of Lucy Hutchinson that we get any sort of portrait of Sir Richard Byron. But unlike most belligerents that incur the withering scorn of Lucy Hutchinson in her writings, her relationship as a subject with Sir Richard Byron is a little bit more ambivalent. Apart from a simple mention in her writings that Sir Richard Byron had been made governor of Newark, this is how Lucy Hutchinson introduces her husband's cousin. The governor of Newark was his cousin to whom he was forced against his nature to be more uncivil than to any other that were governors in that place, whether it were that the dissension of brethren is always most spitefully pursued, or that Sir Richard Byron, as was reported, suffered under the same suspicions on his side. It is true that they were to each other the most uncivil enemies can be imagined. Which sounds to me like they made more of an effort to fight and hate each other because they were related than they might otherwise have bothered with. Which isn't really borne out by the, the way John and Lucy Hutchinson deal with Byron and the way he deals with them over the course of the Civil War. In 1643, John Hutchinson's father, who was also Sir Richard Byron's uncle, died. His estate fell into cavalier hands. Byron, via an emissary called Mr. Asketh, sent a letter to John Hutchinson, offering him his estates back if he would change sides and join the king, warning him that his estates were in danger of falling into other people's clutches because certain cavaliers were appealing to William Cavendish, the big royalist cheese in Nottinghamshire, for the right to claim the vacant rebel estate. So Richard Byron claimed that he was doing this out of love and tender compassion, but also acknowledged that Colonel Hutchinson was probably going to turn down his offer, and so he offered a second piece of advice. His advice was that if Colonel Hutchinson persisted in fighting for the parliamentarian cause, then he would do himself a massive favour to give up the castle and go and fight for the regular Roundhead army because to hang on to one of the king's castles would be considered, if the Cavaliers won the war, an unforgivable act of treason. If Hutchinson joined the army and things went badly for the rebels, then Byron could intercede with him on behalf of the king. But if he stayed in the castle, Byron frankly stated that there will be no colour left to ask favour to you. Hutchinson responded, he acknowledged the shared family bond between them, but rejected Byron's deal on the grounds of conscience. Hutchinson said that he very much scorned so base a thought as to sell his faith for bare rewards or fears, and that he and his wife would stay in the castle, in which it had pleased God to call him in defence of it. Shortly after this exchange, Byron led an attack on Nottingham, let into Nottingham by sympathetic Nottinghamians who were secretly cavaliers. Byron and 600 men occupied the town. His cousin Hutchinson kept hold of the castle. Byron built a fort on the River Trent and used the River Trent to ferry prisoners and plunder up the river to Newark. 
Byron put the word out for any nearby Cavalier support to come and help him take the town. The Cavalier governor of Ashby de la Zouche turned up on day two of the occupation with 400 men. And then, not happy that Byron had started plundering Nottingham without him, he throws a hissy fit and then leaves, almost as soon as he's turned up, taking his 400 men with him. Hutchinson, meanwhile, holed up in the castle, is directing cannon fire at Byron and his men. On day three of the occupation, Byron decides he wants to talk with his cousin and just sort this thing out reasonably. He tries to organise a parley with his cousin. He sends a major Cartwright. Well, Cartwright delivers a letter to John Hutchinson and George Hutchinson to meet them at St Nicholas's Church outside the battlements of the castle. Now, to the Hutchinsons, this is a toxic bit of architecture because Byron has put snipers up in St Nicholas's Church, who the previous day had killed one of Hutchinson's men. Hutchinson receives the letter from his cousin, reads them to his soldiers, and then responds by raising a red flag and blasting chunks off the tower of St Nicholas's Church with his cannons. Not much love and tenderness between cousins there. The stalemate continues for a few more days, and then John Hutchinson, from his lofty position in the castle, spots roundhead reinforcements coming towards Nottingham, and he decides to leave the castle and attack his cousin. Actually, John Hutchinson doesn't lead the attack himself. He sends his really rather scary brother George out to lead the attack. But something happens. Most of Hutchinson's men have been holed up in the castle and their homes have been outside the castle walls, largely being plundered by Byron's men. So the moment they leave the castle, George Hutchinson's men start sneaking off to check out their own homes and property and valuables and family. So by the time George Hutchinson catches up with Byron, he's only got 16 men with him. So the two cousins face each other, Sir Richard Byron, and John Hutchinson's brother, George Hutchinson. George Hutchinson, never one to back down for a fight, orders his musketeers to fire and they overshoot and completely miss Byron and his men. And then Byron's men and Hutchinson's men are amongst each other, engaged in vicious street fighting. And George Hutchinson, I have to say, and his 16 men do very, very well. And they managed to unhorse Byron and take his hat. And Byron managed to climb back onto his horse and his horse is wounded. And he managed to get to the relative safety of the next street before his horse conks out underneath him and dies. And George Hutchinson, who didn't seem as sentimentally disposed towards his cousin as his elder brother, shouts out in typically vicious Hutchinson military rhetoric to go and capture Byron and to take him or shoot him and not let him escape, though they cut his legs off. But Byron does escape and gets away and, and, and manages to hang on to the fort and leaves to protect the fort. Captain Hacker, you remember him from the Three Brothers episode? Well, here he is again in a little guest cameo. In early 1644, Richard Byron suffered a personal tragedy when his brother, his younger brother, Sir Thomas Byron, was murdered in a dispute over pay by one of his own soldiers. Colonel John Hutchinson happened to have in his possession prisoners who'd served under Thomas Byron and as a gesture of solidarity, agreed to swap prisoners with his, his cousin, explicitly as an acknowledgement of the death of a relative. All of this happened before the Second Siege of Newark. Now, Richard Byron was the governor of Newark during the Second Siege, when Newark was surrounded by 7,000 roundheads and was rescued by Prince Rupert of the Rhine. I have covered this siege in much detail in other podcasts, so I'm not going to rake over old coals again. But if you want to know what happened, I would recommend the episodes entitled The Fighting Prince Part 1 and The Daredevil Diarist. After the second siege of Newark, despite Richard Byron's exemplary leadership and hanging on to Newark long enough for Prince Rupert to come and rescue them, factions and squabbling within the Cavalier ranks cost Sir Richard Byron his governorship. Lucy Hutchinson puts it like this, and as if discord had infected the whole English air, 
with an epidemical heart, burning and dissension in all places. Even the king's councils and garrisons were as factiously divided, and the king's commissioners of the governor at Newark fell into such high discontents that Sir Richard Byron was changed and Sir Richard Willis put into his place. After his dismissal as governor of Newark, Sir Richard Byron sort of fades a little bit into the background in terms of his contribution to the war effort. So we're going to jump forward a few years to 1659. The Cavaliers have lost the war. The king is dead. Byron's cousin, John Hutchinson, has actually contributed towards the king's death by being a judge at his trial and signing the king's death warrant. Sir John Byron is also dead. And as Richard Byron was the next eldest brother, the title of Lord Byron falls to him. So he becomes the second Lord Byron. Sir Richard Byron had sort of been keeping his head down and I guess he was living a relatively good life for a defeated cavalier in largely roundhead Nottinghamshire now. But Oliver Cromwell died and there was a little bit of a power vacuum as Cromwell's son, Richard, failed to adequately take hold of the reins of power left by his deceased father. Royalists took advantage of this national insecurity and there was an uprising called Booth's Uprising, named after its instigator, Sir George Booth. And Sir Richard Byron was involved in this uprising, and he sort of got his cousin involved as well. Just prior to the uprising, Sir Richard Byron had ordered himself a nice set of pistols from London. The pistols had been delivered to Nottingham, and Richard Byron was expected to go and pick them up, but he became nervous about picking guns up as he was understandably under suspicion by the authorities as a potential instigator of rebellion, which he actually was, but I think he just genuinely wanted his pistols at this point. So he actually persuades his cousin, John Hutchinson, to pick the pistols up on his behalf and keep them in his house. You know, the way you might arrange for a, an Amazon package to be dropped off at a neighbour's or a friend's, except this isn't a book or, or some CDs or DVDs or Blu-rays. These are guns belonging to a tried and tested enemy of the state, which seems to indicate that in spite of everything that had gone on between them during the war, they both seem to genuinely have affection for each other. A short while after this, Sir Richard Byron was persuaded to join Booth's rebellion and decided he really needed those guns. And he couldn't really ask John Hutchinson for them back, and he knew that he couldn't talk John Hutchinson into joining him in the rebellion. And so Sir Richard Byron, sorry, Lord Byron, was forced to resort to subterfuge. And so he planned to steal his guns back, well, they did belong to him, and also nick any weapons that John Hutchinson had on his estate. No hard feelings, because this is war. He tried to do this by planting a servant in Hutchinson's house. In fact, the servant was already employed by Hutchinson, but had cavalier sympathies, and Byron managed to turn him. The servant was called Ivy. Ivy entered Hutchinson's house on a night when John Hutchinson was away in London. Ivy ordered a younger servant to give John Hutchinson's weapons and his buff coat, that's leather armour, to him. The boy was scared and Ivy basically threatened to pistol whip him if he didn't comply. Ivy literally puts on Hutchinson's armour and takes his personal weapons and rides away on Hutchinson's best horse and tells the young boy that he will be back the next day with 50 soldiers to take the rest of the weapons and just not to get in his way or tell his mistress. Once Ivy's gone, he immediately goes and tells his mistress. Well, he leaves it till next day because she's sleeping. He doesn't want to wake her up. But he tells her. And then Lucy Hutchinson immediately goes and tells the authorities that she's received intelligence of an attack on her home. But she doesn't mention Richard Byron's name. She keeps his name out of it. The family bond is still intact. The authorities promise Lucy Hutchinson military protection. But by the time the soldiers turn up, they're not really needed because the rebellion has failed, leaving Sir Richard Byron hiding out in the woods until all of this nasty business blew over. 
A year later, Sir Richard Byron was able to repay his debt to the Hutchinson family because the year was 1660, the year of the restoration of the monarchy, when Charles II returned to England and rounded up anybody who'd had anything to do with his father's trial and execution and put them on trial. This included Richard's cousin, John Hutchinson, who was in danger of losing his life. Lucy Hutchinson famously forged a letter on behalf of John Hutchinson, expressing a deep remorse that Hutchinson probably didn't feel, but also listing a number of her cavalier friends and relatives, people who would vouch for John Hutchinson's integrity in his hour of need. Amongst those names is Sir Richard Byron. And so Richard Byron helped save his cousin's life, at least for a few years. It was a stay of execution, really. John Hutchinson would eventually be imprisoned on almost certainly trumped-up charges in connection with a roundhead rebellion this time in the north of England. And there's very little that Lord Byron can do this time to save his cousin. And so, with the king back on the throne... Lord Byron was able to enjoy a life of relative aristocratic normality and pass his genes on to the next generation of mad, bad and dangerous to know Byrons, culminating in the crazy poet that we know and love and most readily associate with that name. Thank you for listening. This episode was written, presented and recorded by Adam Nightingale in a secret roundhead Nottingham location. Next week's episode, which will be the last episode in this series, is part two of One Town, Four Governors. And we'll be looking at the life of Richard Willis and Lord John Bellasize. Previous episodes and other extraordinary resources, you really need to check these out, are available on the National Civil War Centre website. Just follow the links for learning from home. The music for this episode was provided by my brother Mark Nightingale. Stay safe, and as my friend Liam says, be calm.